Well, first of all, I want to thank East River Electric for putting this on. This is a, a great opportunity to share some ideas, hear from different folks about this process about livestock development here. So, so we have, uh, I get the honor of uh, moderating this panel. Uh, there's a couple elected officials up here, so I know it's going to be really, really hard to keep them under their 45 second answers. So, but. <laughs> so the first one I'd like to introduce, just to introduce our panels quickly, we've got Jim Schmidt. Jim is a Lincoln County Commissioner. He grew up on a farm near Lenox. Uh, he's still involved with the farm there, I believe. Uh, he also uh, serves as the Lincoln, uh, the Executive Director of the Sioux Empire Housing Par Partnership. And uh, Jim is on the National Association of County Commissioners, where he chairs the Rural Action Caucus. So uh, he is representing South Dakota on the national level there. To his right, we have Jeff Barth, Minnehaha County Commissioner. Jeff has uh, been on the commission since 2007. Both, uh, I should mention, both Jim and Jeff were just re-elected. Uh, Schmidt ran unopposed. Barth uh, finished third in a three-way race, I believe, Jeff. But he, he's still there. Um, uh, one of the things that Jeff has the distinction of is uh, he has served eight years on the Minnehaha County Planning and Zoning Commission which is uh, an eternity for county commissioners who serve on those commissions. So, uh, but he has been on that for a long time. Uh, to his right, we have Brian Sanderson from the Department, South Dakota Department of Ag. Brian is a Lake Preston native who I believe now lives in Ethan. Graduated from SDSU with a bachelor degree in animal science and ag business minor. Uh, previously, Brian has worked for Cargill, Lando Lakes, Perina, per Perina Feeds, and managed a cattle feed yard. So. And on the end of the table there, we have Dana Loski. Dana is the, the chair of the Friends of the Big Sioux River. Dana is, um, he's also a member of the East Dakota Water Development Board. Uh, I saw Jay Gilbertson was here earlier. Jay uh, runs that board where Dana's on. He's a graduate of the University of Nebraska Omaha and is retired general manager from Dean Foods in Sioux Falls. And he is a Columbus, Nebraska native. So welcome gentlemen. So my first question is, we'll start out with uh, Jim here. So Jim, obviously Lincoln County is a growing county, nearing 60,000 people, third largest county in the state. Just 30 years ago, it was a small rural county out, you know, where some people lived that worked in Sioux, Fo worked in Sioux Falls. What, is, what does livestock development mean for a county like yours that has a rich history of livestock? Uh, how, do, how do you balance that you know, with uh, south of 57th Street and then the very rural areas. Steve, let me, let me also extend my thank you for East River to allow county officials to come on in this program and congratulations for all of you that have attended this and have an interest in livestock and its future for our state but not only in our counties. To answer your question, Steve, Lincoln County is two counties divided by a Highway 110. If you've ever been south of Sioux Falls, we have a heavily urban area that constitutes our growth. If you go to major cities like T and Harrisburg, which have grown from four or 500 now to over 5,000, 20% of our, or 80% of our population lives up in that corridor, and then the rest of it is our county. We have one commissioner zoning. He has about, of the 16 townships, he has th three-fourths of the county as his district. We had to make a conscious decision as a county board of whether we wanted to sustain agriculture or not. And we do, because it's extremely important, because it is our number one industry. Our situation is complicated by this. We live so close to Sioux Falls that we have a lot of desirable areas in the south which are very hilly and very nice for small little acreages. And we have many, many of those. And when you try to, if you're engaged in livestock, in agriculture, especially in animal husbandry kind of activities, and you try to fit yourself into between all of these little acreages, you got a real difficult situation. So um, we have, I think, done a credible job on that. I'll probably talk a little more about our zoning situation and how we accomplish that. But I just want you to know that for a county that has both urban and rural, 
it's like sometimes they're walking on parallel lines and they don't stay parallel because they diverse. And to try to keep everybody uh, content um, is next to impossible, but we try. Okay, thank you, Jim. <clears throat> you know, Jeff, I will ask you the same question, and you know, for a little bit of background about Minnehaha County, you have roughly 20,000 people who live in the small municipalities, 20,000 that live in the unincorporated area on farms and acreages, and then a whole lot of people in Sioux Falls. How do you, how, how does livestock happen in a county like that? Well, thanks, Steve, and uh, I'm glad to see so many people sticking around and listening to us. You know, uh, our, our whole county is not a city. Uh, it's, it's often thought that uh, Minnehaha County is all Sioux Falls. Well, it's not. Uh, in fact, our county is, I believe, the number five county in the state for ag income. And if you drive around the county, which I often get to do, uh, you can see, uh, sometimes you get a vista where you don't see another human habitation. Luckily, though, we have uh, paved county roads, and uh, not every county can say that. But the vitality of the county depends on us continuing to keep agriculture alive. And I think we, as a commission, and I didn't originate this idea, I inherited from the commissioners before me, uh, the vitality of our, our small towns and our communities depends on healthy agriculture. We have some towns that, you know, they've lost their grocery store, they've lost their gas station, etc. You know, uh, they still have schools. There was a quote from Bill Even earlier uh, uh, where he said something about uh, you, to have animals means you have to have chores. Well, in order to have jobs, you have to have investment. And when you get a, a concentrated animal feeding operation, uh, you wind up with uh, carpenters, uh, electricians, plumbers, bricklayers, uh, truck drivers, pharmaceutical people, uh, highway maintenance people, uh, uh, electrical uh, power uh, people, water people, all these jobs that pay better than some of these jobs they, they like to boast about in the city of Sioux Falls. We don't need more people making 11 bucks an hour. We need more people having good jobs. Uh, any of you out here into veterinary science? Yeah. Anyway, uh, I guess that's uh, my answer. Okay, all right. So moving on here, Brian with the Department of Ag. Uh, what, are, what are some of the common obstacles that you see with the zoning and permitting process for animal agriculture? Thanks, Steve, um, and thanks to East River for asking me to be part of this a panel. Part of this panel, um, the most common obstacles actually starts with the projects themselves, them not understanding their project and the impact that it has locally. From there, the process actually that that project has to go through to get permitted, and therefore they can't answer and or address some of the concerns from the public, which leads to. You know, and it was talked earlier on a couple different panels uh, about the lack of understanding and acceptance of modern livestock production. So you're saying that the, the, those people, meaning the county permitting officers, the zoning board, the county commissioners, not understanding? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes the you know people that are making the decisions don't actually know the process that they have to go through. And sitting in a couple um, county hearings is actually the project themselves went in prepped and prepared and they were educating the county commissioners during the meeting on the process that the decision makers had to go through in order to approve and or deny the project. Do you see a difference there in sizes of counties where maybe some of the folks don't quite grasp what's going on? In my travels and talking um, to people and to projects, the size of the, of the county it isn't the make or break of the projects. It's actually the gentlemen that are sitting to my left. The county commissioners, it, they either understand and are accepting of what livestock means to the rural communities and or more progressive communities. There's a couple, or counties, there's a couple sitting up here that are actually close to heavy residential areas and they're still getting projects done. And then there are other counties, you know, way more rural that have actually recently denied a couple. Okay. Okay, so on the end there we have Dana. Dana, what are some of the misconceptions associated with <clears throat> livestock production 
with, with the folks that you, you work with, with Friends of the Big Sioux River? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I'd have to, uh, I do have to correct Chris on his introduction. He said he had four experts up here. Well, there's three experts here, and then there's myself. Uh, so I'm just a, a person with a lot of opinions, um, like it or not. So, uh, one, you know, uh, uh, Steve asked what uh, misperceptions. And, you know, whenever you, you uh, join a group uh, um, today, it seems like you have to be, you have to drink all the Kool-Aid. You have to... Uh, be all this way or you have to be all that way, there's no middle road. And uh, that's not the attitude that uh, uh, our group has taken. Um, uh, we are definitely pro-ag development. When you look uh, uh, at uh, uh, the geography of South Dakota and uh, the population of South Dakota, we're too far away from major markets to talk about major manufacturing to grow our economy. Uh, luckily, on the eastern side of the state, at least we don't have the extractive industries that uh, can be so damaging. So the best and cleanest development that we can have in, in at least the eastern side of South Dakota is ag development. And so uh, when we got into this, you know, the first thing, I, uh, you know, the people that were friends of mine and other uh, people that got interested in how can we clean up the Big Sioux River and what can we do, one of the first things that, you know, everybody does, you go to Google University and you look up and you hear all the ho horror stories that are happening with uh, from... Um, across the country with uh, ag development, whether it's North Carolina or whether it's Iowa, and you hear of all the terrible things like, you know, CAFOs, CAFOs, CAFOs. They're just, uh, they're putting them up just to destroy our water in that. And, uh, uh, and so um, uh, when you, uh, when I started going to East Dakota Water Development District boards, uh, I met uh, John Mose, who's on the board, and Gary Duffy, who's on the, used to be on the board of the corn growers. And uh, John invited me out to, to uh, his uh, operation to see uh, what he's doing. And I was totally impressed with the fact that uh, here are these, uh, when you go out to a CAFO or a modern uh, uh, livestock operation, today confined operation, uh, here you see the animals are in a clean environment. They're, uh, they're well fed. Uh, they're getting clean water. Uh, uh, the ventilation is great. There's hardly any odor. There's almost uh, uh, no flies. And you can see it's a much better situation than, than uh, them uh, wallowing out and uh, getting the water out of a, a muddy creek bed where the udders are getting uh, full of uh, mud and contamination. And, the, and uh, then you have to buy vet or buy antibiotics to get your cows healthy again, which increases your input costs. And, and uh, uh, I saw a zero runoff operation, um, uh, nice wetlands on his area. And, it, and, and uh, so from then on out, I just started going to other uh, touring other operations and the same thing. It's just duplicated over and over again that uh, what the development that's taking place in, in uh, uh, eastern South Dakota with confined animal feeding operations is, is, a, is great for clean water and it's a benefit. Uh, and then um, why, um, Jeff asked me to speak to uh, the Minnehaha County um, um, Commission and I went there and then also uh, went to Yankton County and, and talked to their uh, uh, PNZ board about uh, our opinion about um, uh, operations. And uh, uh, after my remarks uh, got picked up and published, um, I got torn uh, apart on Facebook by uh, people from other uh, uh, organizations. And uh, so I, I'm not a real fan of social media now. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> But I still stand by it, uh, that you need to have your opinions based on fact and not just based on what happens in other states or what you see on the internet. So uh, those are some of the misperceptions and we're trying to uh, stop some of those. One, one other thing I'd like to add to that, uh, for full disclosure, Dana was invited to speak to the Ag United board about two years ago. He came in and spoke to our board. Uh, we heard earlier some of the panelists talking about farmers need to be able to tell their story, and, and, and Dr. Toller talked about taking speech class. Uh, it really, you know, Dana has been willing to go, I assume, out of his comfort zone to get in front of some of these people to talk to, and certainly I think it, it bodes well for everyone if there's that dialogue. Uh, there have been people uh, that Dana has brought out to some farms in CAFOs in Minnehaha County that I know probably did not like what was going on at that farm, but I think they have a better understanding, and we certainly would encourage farmers to do that as well, to have that dialogue, to know what's going on. Yeah, and let me just say one thing. When, when uh, we are trying to address clean water issues, uh, I, I, we break it up into urban issues and rural issues. I mean, the watershed flows through both areas and cross political boundaries. Um, but uh, the one nice thing about dealing, uh, he talked about being out of my comfort zone. Actually, when I go to an ag seminar that our NRCS puts on or the Soil Coalition puts on, I feel more comfortable there because 
uh, the agricultural community is talking about conservation and is doing something about conservation. And when you t try and go to a, uh, a meeting of developers in the city of Sioux Falls, conservation is a four-letter word for them. They don't understand it. That's something that happens in the ag community. It's not applied to, to, to an urban community. So I really have to compliment the ag community for uh, uh, being uh, concerned about the future generations, what the resources are leaving for uh, their sons and grandsons and, and granddaughters and so on. So thank you, Stan. Great. Thanks, Dan. Okay, coming back to Lincoln County. Jim, there's a lot of young uh, students here. Many of them are going to go back to, the, to their home areas, maybe want to put up a hog barn or a cattle facility. Can you walk us through what's that quick process for Lincoln County? How, what would they need to do and how do they do it to get, to get their permit? I'm going to try, Steve. Uh, before I go, I, got, I just got to tell you, I got one of my bosses here. Terry Labrie sits up front here. She's on the Value Added Finance Authority Board, of which I serve on. And she told me that I was the most delinquent member that they've had. I'm going to try and do better next time. That's just publicly confessing, okay? To you young people out there that think you have a, an idea that you want to start a, uh, a, a, conf a CAFO, a confined animal feeding operation, it's, you go through a conditional use permit. A CUP. In, this, in, in Lincoln County, we got four classes. We've got a C and D class, which says that you have to have a minimum of 1,320 feet from, the, from a habitable dwelling. A B is a larger uh, uh, operation, which is tw a quarter of a mi or a half mile. And if you want a class A, which is a very large uh, feeding operation, you have to have three-fourths of a mile. Most of what we can uh, do is 2,499 head, less than 2,500, and that's that minimum uh, standards that we have. So those are the four classes. Now, Lincoln County has adopted several things which uh, I'm very proud of, that I think they're very proactive. In addition to the setback requirements, we've adopted the odor control that was established here by SDSU that gives you the parameters of when you have about four days out of a month that you will have any kind of odor in your, in your particular uh, dwelling if you're with beyond this particular numbers, like I said, 1320. That odor control management, we, we set a standard of 97%. And if you haven't looked at that and you haven't used it, it's a very, very good tool. It's very scientific. And we've had many people try to repudiate that, but I'll stand on that, on his research. And I apologize, I do not remember the gentleman's name that came up with that. The other unique things we have is this. You go through the conditional use permit, you have your hearing number one, that's where you're going to a a apply for this. We, uh, we announce it, we announce where it's at. You have your second hearing where you take public testimony, and that's where all the fun begins because in Lincoln County, you got two sides of the courthouse. You got the pros on one side, and you got the, uh, all the in individuals that are opposed to any kind of feeding operation whatsoever. By the way, I'll also say that we have a nursery. If you, be, if you put up a nursery, a pig nursery, you do not need a conditional use permit. That's a permitted use. We allow you to come in, you put one up, you got it, you take care of it. So, we go through the conditional use process. We have a young man, Shane Zilstra. Uh, we met with him. We went through the whole painful process. So here's, and I'm going to take another 30 seconds. We put 15 different uh, qualifications on his CAFO. I mean, he's got trees, he's got berms, he's got wood chips, he's got more things on there than you can ever imagine. 15 of those. And so, he met every one of our qualifications, every one he had done. So I made the motion that said, well, I, give, I gave the people in the audience this statement. You got two choices. You can allow the conditional use permit established by your county officials that our ordinances were reviewed, we looked at, we took public testimony, and these are the qualifications, and this is the rules that we put forth, and by God, we're going to live by them. Or, Shane can throw those aside, go to the state of South Dakota, and ask for a permit. 
None of these 15 apply anymore. He gets a permit from the state. The state comes and asks us, has Shane met every one of your guidelines, Lincoln County? And we say, yes, he has. They stamp it, he's got a permit. We established at that point a permissive use. It's from the state, permissive use for Lincoln County. We give him a building permit. We're probably the only county that does that. And I know there are people that are very upset with that. But when you think about it, if you're gonna maintain and you're gonna have a viable animal, uh, or a animal on farms, and allow young men, like we heard here a little bit ago, to continue with agriculture, then counties have gotta step up, make your rules, and don't equivocate. If you have a setback of 1,320 feet, don't start dilly-dallying around saying, well, you know, maybe we can do or something else. Stick by a rule. It's a law that you have set because counties that judges at this time, we are judges, and we have to enforce our own ordinances. I'll shut up now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for walking through that process, what's going on there. Uh, Jeff, similar type question for you. Um, you know, Jim mentioned the setback distance from the, from the livestock facility. In, you know, it's hard to find a half mile away from a neighbor in Lincoln County or Minnehaha County. What, do you, what can you guys do uh, to help a producer who can't meet that half mile or can't get the neighbor to sign off? Well, I, I guess uh, we've, been a, we've been able to find a spot where uh, people will sign off. Uh, uh, we had one, one time where it was, uh, uh, the building was gonna be 20 feet too close to the neighbor who wouldn't sign off. We moved it 20 feet the other way and it worked. Um, that said, I think, as Jim said, first thing you do is you go to the planning department. They will tell you if you're building on an aquifer or if there's uh, electric available or if there's water available. Um, so I, I would say go there first. Then you need to meet with the experts. You need to meet with your engineers, your architects, your, uh, your animal people, your feed people, your financial people, and, and then Again, go back to the planning people and then bring it forward. I know uh, Jim referenced the, uh, the odor uh, uh, district, or odor, odor control plan that, they, that SDSU developed. Well, we had a, a guy bring in a copy of that uh, written in crayon on an empty feed sack. And uh, we had to work with that guy to improve his plan because it was too, too amateurish. We need to have professional people coming with their finances lined up with the we've had we've approved projects that eventually fell through because their financing uh, expired before they put a spade in the ground and so let's make sure we've got everything in a row bring it forward and yes we do get we do get people objecting and I was down there in Lincoln County watching them uh, on that particular one but you know, sometimes there's just a little tweak that can be made that makes it uh, more palatable to the neighbor. Sometimes moving at 20 feet solves the legalistic problem, but sometimes putting a tree in a different spot solves the, the real neighbor problem. And uh, oftentimes we've deferred action uh, to allow people to come back and, and talk with each other. And that's, that's another thing that needs to happen. You need to talk to your neighbors. Uh, it's not a farmer's favorite thing, I would guess, uh, because uh, too often we have them coming in all uh, in a tizzy. No one ever told me. Uh, and I've had cousins come in, cousins that were on opposite sides. And uh, why they didn't talk to each other, I don't know. Of course, you know, we, we publish it in our, uh, in our newspapers. Uh, we, we mention it in our public meetings. Um, we send out postcards to every neighbor within a certain distance and uh, we put signs on the property that's being rezoned, and still people come in and say, well, no one ever told me. I don't know how they ever wound up coming to the meeting, <laughs> uh, but there they are. <laughs> and uh, Social know, media, <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> we've, we've actually had uh, times when we postponed uh, hearings. In fact, just recently, we changed our ordinance slightly because it used to be you had to, had to send it um, 
a certified mail and somebody at the post office told this applicant that registered mail is cheaper and so we sent it registered mail. Well, it didn't count. We had to rehear it. We had to re uh, uh, put it in the paper and, and start the process all over. Hopefully, uh, he's, he'll still get it done. But I think this year in Minnehaha County, we approved five different uh, CAFOs and uh, I think four of them were for hog operations. And the only thing that really got appealed and raised a little ruckus was a cell tower that we approved. And uh, the, the opponents, uh, it was going to cause their cows to give less milk and kids were going to go off the road texting and, um, and they were going to use it to spy on their swimming pool. Uh, I thought that would be wind. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to get into wind towers. <laughs> no, so. You know, the, the fact is, though, that anything you can think of will be brought up by an opponent. And, and not always is it something that makes sense. Uh, we approved a fertilizer plant, and uh, the neighbor, uh, who was 1,000 feet away from the anhydrous ammonia, said that they were going to have to have gas masks in their entrance foyer by their coat rack. Uh, in case of a discharge. Meanwhile, 200 feet away is a railroad track carrying uh, oil from North Dakota that could blow up and destroy everything for a quarter mile. Anyway, people uh, get, a, get in a tizzy about these things, but I will also say that six months later, they've forgotten about it and it's just their neighbor. Okay. Okay, so Brian, you, you work with producers, you know, how do you advise them to be prepared to go in front of these gentlemen to face those tough questions and those emotional crowds? A lot of it comes um, down to preparing the project themselves. They have to understand their project and more importantly, the impact it's gonna have at a local level. They need to be able to address odor concerns, pests, roads, environment, financial, taxes, you know, those kind of things. And from there, putting together a solid plan to go about it, to understand the process, you know, per that county's, you know, rules to achieve their permit. And there are um, parties, so to speak, or groups that can help in this process. One from the state level with, with ag development, the local planning districts, and there's some private consulting companies that have popped up that will help as well. Okay. Dina, what, in your opinion, what, what is the balance between environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable look like? Uh, well, I'm going to, um, because of my career in consumer products, uh, I'm probably going to answer this on a, a, a little different scale than just uh, what's happening, you know, uh, inciting something locally. I think the, the, the um, you know, first thing you've got to do is you've got to listen to the consumer. You know, whether you manufacture a product or go a, uh, grow a product, you really have to rely on someone to buy that. And your market is not just the, the local town, your market isn't just the state of South Dakota, your market is, is nationally and internationally, as we heard with all the issues that tariffs are, are, are hurting our soybeans and pork and so on. So uh, if, you, um, if you listen to the consumer, and when I say the consumer is from San Diego to New York, uh, and you go out to those cities and you'll see that uh, uh, you've lost a lot of customers for, for what uh, we're producing out here today. Uh, consumers have changed away from the, uh, many of the products that we make. Uh, you know, uh, they're fed up with GMOs on the coast. They, uh, you go to Costco, the number one grocery store right here in, in uh, South Dakota in Sioux Falls, and you see nothing but grass-fed beef, uh, non-GMO poultry. Uh, and so you have to realize that if you continue to do the same things that you've always done, you're probably going to continue to have to rely on uh, whims of other people, and I don't think that's what you know producers really want to do. I think they like to be independent and, and uh, uh, row their own boat uh, and not rely on other uh, other people to be uh, economically sustainable. So uh, I can give you some examples of, uh, of what really misfired or uh, went wrong for somebody that was listening uh, to somebody else. Uh, for example, uh, uh, a few years ago when I actually entered the dairy business, there was a uh, the per capita consumption of fluid milk was 30 to 33 gallons uh, uh, per year per person. That meant that in in the course of a year, almost almost everybody at least you know uh, drank a half a gallon or more of, of milk a week. Uh, and uh, at, at the same time, in the early 90s, there was a glut of milk. Uh, dairy prices were low. Does that sound familiar? 
and uh, entered uh, this this new company called not new company but uh, a new company probably to uh, uh, the ag business uh, uh, the called Monsanto that came out with this product called uh, uh, recombinant bovine growth hormone BST and came around to all the dairies and said geez you know you can feed this to the cattle the milk production is going to go up 33 percent and uh, uh, you can't tell the difference consumers will never know and uh, so um, and they said, well, yeah, but w w my question was when, the, when we met up at a corporate boardroom in Atlanta Lakes, I said, geez, well, there's already a glut of milk. What, what, why would we want to have more milk produced? And they said, well, the answer was, well, all the inefficient producers that don't use our product are going to go out of business. And so anyway, uh, processors across the country started buying milk uh, from dairy farmers that were using BST. And next thing you know, the consumers didn't trust the milk anymore. And milk was... Uh, milk was a gold standard. It was the single largest product category in the grocery store. Five percent of the total grocery store sales just came from fluid milk. Uh, it was a gold standard for safety, health. I mean, mothers didn't doubt it at all. And then here, all of a sudden, we, they started doubting after, after uh, all this artificial hormones started being put in the milk. They started to doubt the safety of milk. And they started believing, oh, my God, it must, if it's full of these artificial hormones, it must have... Uh, pesticides in it, herbicides in it, uh, God knows what. I just can't trust that milk anymore. And so they started leaving the category. And a lot of them left it for other, I would call them chemistry kits, of uh, things like almond milk, soy milk. I mean, if you ever look at the side panel of uh, one of these almond milks, it, I mean, it, it, it's a chemist's dream. And, uh, and that's natural, and that's what people were leaving for. And then a lot of them left and, and uh, really went to the bottled water industry. But um, so Monsanto was right. Uh, um, they did get a lot of producers out of business, and, and unfortunately, it was a lot of efficient producers as well, because the market went away. Uh, today, I think the per capita consumption for milk is, uh, fluid milk is about 14 gallons. So they took the single largest category in the grocery store and decreased it by about 60%, the entire industry. So when you look at the, the dairy industry, you can say it's probably been made up for by increasing uh, cheese consumption and uh, uh, butters even come back. But fluid milk has, has really been hurt by dairy processors or dairy producers listening to their suppliers and continuing to buy what their suppliers told them they should be doing. So that's why I say don't listen to your suppliers. They want you to continue to buy the same thing they've always sold you. Listen to the consumers and anticipate what the consumer is going to be or going to want. And that consumer is, is a global consumer now. It's just not what happens at, in, in your local market. So uh, that's one example, and I could go on and cite other examples that where companies have elected to be more uh, economically feasible first or sustainable and not looking at being environmentally or socially uh, conscious and either out of business or the category has almost been destroyed. So. Okay. This is kind of a question for both Jeff and Jim here. Uh, you guys are dealing with zoning ordinances that deal with farm families all the time. How often do you guys look at those ordinances to make sure that they're adapting to the changes in as agriculture changes? I think it's incumbent upon the county to uh, look at theirs at a minimum of every three to five years. Things change in agriculture today so rapidly, as you all know. And to try to stay adept at uh, how not only agriculture changes, but as your county has changed. What are your demographics in your county? You know, how many of you, um, I, I get the privilege of serving on a national association of county officials. And there are 50 uh, bloated egos, I call them, when we all get together as a board. Because everybody thinks that their particular state or their county is the best. And I hate to tell them, and this is, hurts Jeff tremendously, but there is the number one county in the state of South Dakota, which is, which is Lincoln. Anyway, I had to say that. Charles Mix is number two, and... <laughs> anyway, if you're going to do that, you have to be able to reflect what you, what's the population and what your county's like. So your zoning requirements may change. You may end up having to, to uh, put things further back. You may have to shorten them up. You may have to do that. But if you never really do that. But the other thing that's very important, you've got to have public trust. You've got to let the public know that you're willing to listen to them. 
If you blindly go about your business and you never take the time for input from those individuals, whether you want to hear it or not, unfortunately you hear more of what you don't want to hear than what you want to hear. But I think it's incumbent to do that because transparency is very important today. Public trust is very important today. And I, a lot of times the public doesn't trust. They don't, they don't have confidence. They don't think that we're, we're listening to them. And so therefore, when you go and review your ordinances and you're reviewing your zonings and you're reviewing all of those things, you gotta take public input and let them figure out, you know, and to some of you, it, it is a pain. I mean, I've sat in on, I, I, had a, I had a great idea once to have a town hall meeting and that was the most painful experience I ever had because all I ever heard was what a rotten job we were doing. You know, it's like finding one of them dandelions that get in the middle of a field when you're doing spring work. You see one bright little dandelion. One guy did pay us a compliment and that's what I compared it to. So anyway, uh, the, the idea is do it not on a, on a regular basis so that people know that you're not just putting them in place once in the Ten Commandments and you never look back. Jeffrey? Lincoln County, huh? Well, where your opportunity begins. I, I tell you, uh, uh, we've modified our, our ordinances fairly often, but it's not always like on a regular schedule. We learn from other, other disasters going on around the state. Uh, you know, we had, uh, uh, we, we recently changed our ordinance to allow fish farming in Minnehaha County, which was not uh, previously allowed under our ordinance. And we happened to do that when we also changed uh, some of our other provisions on CAFOs. And we picked a time when we didn't have an application on uh, coming forward. I think uh, one other county who had, uh, was faced with a uh, possible six million or seven million chickens, they, they modified their ordinance then. Well, the time to modify it is before you have the application in front of you. And uh, interestingly, that, at that time, the, uh, the setback for seven million chickens would have been 13 and a half miles. So you would have had to have a 13 and a half mile diameter circle that, with no neighbors objecting. Well, uh, it's impossible. And you could have a nuclear reactor closer than that. You know, and if you can't see it, can't smell it, it's not poisoning the air and it's not poisoning the water, what the hell's the problem with it? So we put in a maximum setback yeah, it used to be if you had a thousand animal units, it was this far, two thousand that far, and so it 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 went up and up, and uh, we changed that, so that's gone. Um, just recently, we changed it, a requirement we had for trees. Uh, it turned out that uh, we we required a, a licensed landscaper to sign off on the landscaping for around uh, uh, the trees around the CAFOs, and. Uh, the conservation people and the, uh, and the CAFO applicants both said that it was an onerous uh, uh, provision. So it was just a little thing, but you know, we changed it. Not a single person came to that meeting to complain or demand anything on it. And uh, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not that hard to change things, but you have to be able to explain it, just like the applicants do when they come in. And it's best to do it when there's not any high pressure, $100 million investment hanging on the horizon. So uh, I guess that would be a lesson. And I would say also that we had uh, the guy that had the crayon writing on the feedback uh, with, uh, with uh, his pest control plan was to get a cat for his dairy barn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brian, how, how do you guys, uh, you know, the, the 9,500 cow dairies, the 9,000 head sow barns are the ones that are in the news all the time. What is that balancing act for ag development folks with the Department of Ag in the type of request you get? I mean, is it different for the 500 cow dairy, the robotic dairy versus a 9,000 cow dairy or 5,000 cow dairy? How do, you, how do you guys juggle that and handle that? First, um, you know, in talking about size of operations in South Dakota, there, there's room for all sizes, both big and, and little, and ag development and the Department of Ag approach each of them in the, in the same way, so to speak. Um, 
depending on the county, depending on, I would say, the plan these projects have going in really dictates not only the success, but also the feedback they get. There's been some rather large facilities that have gone in that have received very little with the right plan. And there are some very small ones, or rather small ones, that have been turned down because they haven't had a plan in place. Okay. Sure. Dina, uh, what do you think the state of South Dakota could do from a regulatory or permitting process that would enhance or alleviate fears that some of your membership may have? Uh, well, first of all, I would have to say, uh, uh, this might be heresy in this room, but uh, uh, regulations are not a four-letter word. Uh, they're actually good for your business. It puts everybody on the same uh, level playing field. It gets rid of the poor producers or the ones that are taking shortcuts that give the rest of you bad, uh, bad names. Um, regain the trust uh, that Americans have in, uh, in locally grown food and, and uh, um, food products. Um, and when, when a regulation is proposed, the worst thing you can do is go out and fight the regulation. You know, you can go back and look at the tuna industry. When uh, the tuna industry, canned tuna especially, was on a uh, huge food staple. Uh, it was up to over four pounds uh, per capita consumption in the late 80s. And then the study came out that the uh, FDA um, uh, uh, sanctioned and said, geez, there's a lot of methyl mercury in tuna. And you, know, you can just mention the word mercury, and everybody in this room knows mercury is not good for your health. Uh, maybe just tiny, tiny bits of it's okay, but um, uh, you don't want it in, in a large scale um, uh, consumption. So that started hurting sales, and well, then the tuna industry came out and said, well, yeah, but it's really not that, that bad. There's not that much mercury. All they did was increase the volume of how bad mercury was, and that's what consumers heard. And then the second punch came when um, they realized that, geez, when you, uh, the tuna industry, when they catch tuna, they are also catching a, a lot of dolphins, and they're killing a lot of dolphins when they catch it. And again, they said, well, you know, we're not really, the tuna industry, the fishermen came back, said, it's really not that many dolphins we're killing. You're overstating it. Well, again, they're, they're amplifying the fight. And then the worst thing you can do is saying, geez, I'm, 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 I'm really not killing that many dolphins. Do you think that's good for, <laughs> for is that's a sort of advertising um, slogan you want for your product? So embrace the regulations. I mean, don't, uh, I've got a nephew that runs a, um, uh, charter boat operation on Lake of the Ozarks, where the, you know, you had the recent duck boat thing where I think there were 19 fatalities. Uh, we were at a family gathering a couple weeks ago, and he's been moaning the fact, oh, the feds are going to put them out of business. They're, they're going to come in and put all these new regulations in. And I said, geez, Mike, I said, maybe you ought to look at this as an opportunity to be the first one on the lake that adapts whatever safety regulations they, they come out with. And you could advertise yourself as the safest operation on the Lake of the Ozarks and, and even go one step further than what they ask. And I, your business is going to go through the roof. And he said, well, you know, I've never looked at it that way. So my point is, is that if, 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 um, if you want to really regain some of the trust, and, and we want to re I'd love to see this fluid milk industry bounce back, is, is uh, you know, ask for more regulations. You know, re reward the good operators. Uh, you know, avoid, un, you know, for example, if, if you've raised the permit cost for a CAFO uh, and you put that into the total pounds of product that you put out of a CAFO over the course of a, of a, a permit, life uh, of a permit, it would amount to about one-tenth of a cent per pound in, on beef cattle. That is so minor. And then you, in the minds of the consumer, if you then hired a, 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 a let's say, a, a, a dairy specialist or an environmental specialist that went out and periodically visited CAFO operations and said, geez, you know, I see, I see they're getting a little high on, on your uh, dikes or on your banks over here. Um, yeah, but I, I really can't find any place for it because of the time of year. And yeah, I know I already experienced that at so-and-so's farm down the road. Here's what he did, and here's what I would suggest you do. So we can avoid any potential things. And then the people that, you know, if you like it or not, three or four of the voters are, are now in, in the metro areas in South Dakota. They realize then that, geez, they are doing the best they can to protect uh, my environment, my water, and so on. And it's going to be minimal cost. And you could even have a checkoff thing that would pay for it. It's your future. And if you want people to, to stop coming to these CAFOs and, or uh, court, court hearings or county commission hearings and objecting to expansion of your operation and that, do something proactive 
that uh, uh, lets people know that you're looking out for them, not just for your own income. And you'll, you'll thrive. There's, and, and you avoid all this headache. There's no sense making lawyers rich when you can put that money into your operation and, and uh, into your bank account. So um, anyway, I would okay. just say don't feel that regulations are, are a bad thing. They can be a good thing for you. So. Thank you. We've got a few minutes for questions. Anyone from the audience here? Okay. Uh, I've got a comment and then a question here for these guys. Uh, you know, there's a couple folks that are in the audience here, and I don't know if they're going to stick around later. Uh, Todd Kays from First District in Watertown. Uh, and then I think Eric Singer's here, I saw. Eric is here from uh, NECOG up in Aberdeen. I'm, if I miss anybody from Third District? Okay. So, anyway, those folks work with county commissions on putting together their planning and zoning ordinances. The key, work is, key word is they work for the county commissioners. So the county commissioners direct those guys to say, hey, we want to look at our, we want to review our plans, help us walk us through that process. And then it's up to the commissioners to invite their constituents and members of their county in to do that. So, you know, it's a very important process. And I know that it's often been said that, you know, government is run by the people who show up. And truly on the county level, if you show up, you will have a say in how your county is run. So um, with that, any other comments that you guys have before we hand this off to the next group? Just, you got to keep it short. Just one thing. I think it's incumbent upon commissioners, if you're in here, that you educate the public on your ordinances. And on, uh, it's also incumbent upon you individuals that want to promote agriculture to advance your case. I would also offer one other thing. If you're going to put a CAFO up, make sure you invite your commissioners and your planning and zoning board out to see the physical site. I think one of the greatest uh, disc, uh, services, uh, we just get a map. We don't see the map. You have to actually see the physical arrangement, see where the neighbors are, see where this place is put. Thank you. Jeff, any comments? Used all the time. <laughs> well, the one thing I would just add to that is that certainly these meetings get very emotional sometimes. And, and we've seen where some counties, you know, let emotions rule the day, which makes it very hard for that farm family. So. Yes, uh, Todd Case from First District. 25 years in the trenches of doing this, and if you're a young farmer, young producer, My advice to you is if you're going to be applying, if you're going to be applying for a CAFO permit and your 10-year plan is, you know, uh, will we'll never be more than 2,000 head, don't think your generation, think your children's and your grandchildren's. So if you think that you might need 4,000 animals 20 or 25 years from now, go in and make the ask now because the, the landscape will change over the next 15 to 20 years, and I'm only asking for what I think I need right now, it might end up hurting you in the long run. Well said. The grain farmer doesn't build a 10,000 bushel grain bin when he knows he's going to be producing 15,000 two years down the road, so very well said. So with that, if everyone could please thank our panelists for being up here, and then we'll move on to the next one. <laughs>